Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so this is a little different to what we normally do to our webinars. This is a, a tech talk. So this is more of a technology uh, focus today. Um, we give a warm welcome to Derliang who's presenting for us. Um, he's come in from Estonia yesterday. So we're pretty lucky to have him here with us in Melbourne. And before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, uh, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. Also pay my respects to the elders past and present. Uh, so we are going to be running a bit of a Q&A, so we'd ask that you use the Q&A at the top of your screen, um, avoid using the chat function if you can. Um, and our contact details are at the end, so if there's anything that we don't get to, then um, we'll get to that for you. And it's just a bit on why we run these, um, just about sharing knowledge and facilitating education and um, basically getting a bit of an overview of some of the technology that we represent. And here's a little bit about our guest speaker, who I'll hand over to in just a second. As I said, we want to give him a warm welcome and thank him for joining us. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over. Okay, good afternoon. So, my name is Dur Liang. I represent a manufacturing company from uh, Estonia. This is the uh, European Union. Um, the company is called Laser Diagnostic Instruments. It's a bit of an old company, but uh, the word laser in the name is just a moniker that we kept for a long time. And uh, in our products, we, we don't actually have any lasers. <laughs> so, so laser diagnostic instruments, we produce the ROW, the Remote Optical Watcher, the Early Detection System for Oil and Water. It is a industrial and environmental uh, monitoring system for the detection of oil spills, which could be large or small. Okay, so a little bit about our company background. Um, about 30 years ago, uh, we started the company. It's been around for a, a while. Um, it actually drew its name or drew its time from some of the old Soviet uh, technologies. We uh, LDI was previously um, an expertise or a manufacturer of LIDAR technologies. Um, these are large uh, airborne instruments that you would put on ships or airplanes to scan for particles in the air. Uh, that was the original um, set, uh, original product of how we got our, our name and, and, and purpose. But in the last 12 years, we've completely uh, went in a separate direction with our product, the RLW. And now we make the small product, the small sensor for the purposes of industry and environmental monitoring. A little bit about our company. We are located in Estonia. Estonia is a small Baltic country located in the northwest corner of Europe. We are in the Eurozone. We are in NATO, so there's no <laughs> worries about uh, Russian invasion. And um, we, we keep uh, friendly relationships with Russia for commercial purposes. But of course, the situation is quite tense at the moment. Um, the population of Estonia is around 1.3, 1.28 million. So it's a tiny little country. The main export for Estonia is IT technology and IT solutions. Um, LDI is actually one of the very few companies that exports a sensor, a physical product uh, to the rest of the world. And uh, as a company, we are a research and development company. We do, we make our own products. Uh, design our own uh, um, uh, solutions, and we also manufacture the RLW sensor, which we export around the world. The business model for our company is that we work with local distributors from around the world. So here in, in Australia, we, we work with Hydro, Hydro Terra, 
and um, other um, companies from uh, other parts of the world, all over the world. And uh, they help us market and distribute the sensor to relevant end customers um, who need our, our sensor. So the remote optical watcher, it's a non-contact instrument that uses uh, fluorescence technology or UV fluorescence as the basis uh, or the, 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 the guiding principle. If you imagine the, uh, the camera on your mobile phone, on your smartphone, uh, the flash, the little uh, LED flash uh, that's attached to the, uh, the front of the, of the camera, that is the size of the LED that we use uh, for, for our technology. So it's very small, it's very low power, the system uses about 1.6, 1.7 watts at continuous monitoring. So it's it's a very um, a very efficient system for for usage. So the principle behind it is using UV excitation and emissions, and this is the same technology that you would use in an analyzer. Um, it's just that we've changed, we configured it so that it works as a non-contact sensor in the field. So if you imagine the, the, the RLW sensor, uh, it has a range of up to 10 meters. So you could put it 10 meters or up to 10 meters or around 33 feet above the surface of the water. Um, it's continuously uh, beaming down a, a pulse UV light onto the surface. And if you get an oil spill or if it detects a level of fluorescence higher than what the normal uh, water uh, fluorescence is, then you could have an emissions and uh, our sensor is broadcast at a specific wavelength. That's a proprietary wavelength uh, that we use to detect this hydrocarbon or, or hydrocarbons. And once you get this emissions, you can send out an alert. So it does this in real time. Um, the frequency of, 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 of the monitoring is actually around one about 20 to 30 times per second. So in fact, this is, uh, it, it takes an average of that number and it's the software that's actually the lagging part. Um, when, when you connect this to a, a, a continuous monitoring device, like a data logger, you basically get uh, one reading per second. So we have uh, the, the technology, it comes in different enclosures. So the, the, the optics, the outputs, the power requirements are the same throughout. It's just that we swap out the enclosures given uh, as the environment uh, demands. So the aluminum model, this is our base model. It uses a uh, aluminum enclosure and the majority of our sales are for this base model. Next, we have the stainless steel and this is for offshore or ports or any environment with uh, corrosive uh, gases or corrosive uh, um, air. Uh, so it could be salt water, it could be marine. Um, we have this installed on buoys, we have this installed on uh, different platforms out in the middle of the sea. And then lastly, we have a ATEX or zone one uh, certified uh, enclosure. This is completely certified for zone one for uh, by DNB. So this is no Norwegian uh, certification company. It's third party certified. So it should be recognized uh, everywhere in the world, including in Australia. And this is what you would use for if a customer demands it in the oil and gas sector. So the analog outputs and the various outputs for the instruments. Um, it has three outputs. All of our instruments have three outputs. Uh, one is the basic relay. Um, another one is Modbus. And of course we have the analog output. And all of these outputs, you can connect it to third party loggers or third party um, alarm systems as you see fit, or you could connect all of them together. So this allows you to network multiple sensors um, in, in a single network and be able to monitor all your, your instruments on, on a one network and one um, monitoring output or a monitoring screen. 
So why is our technology useful or why it's being, why is it being used? When you think about oil spills, um, you think about the oil and gas industry. Um, originally, our, our focus was on ports, um, but with the oil and gas industry that, that became uh, a much more predominant uh, industry, uh, of course, in that time, we, we, in that time, we diversified our, our portfolio in, in different targets. Uh, but it all comes down to reducing the amount of damage, reducing loss, the costs, and downtime. Imagine if you can continuously monitor your water, uh, your sump pits, or your settling ponds, or your reservoirs, and be able to monitor in real time uh, if there is a spreading oil spill. You be able to respond quickly. You be able to respond um, efficiently and effectively, and therefore you you reduce what could be a catastrophic oil spill into something that is manageable. And, th and that is the gist, that is the whole reason why our technology is being used. When we, when LDI started marketing the RLW sensor uh, back in 2012, 2013, the idea was, we had the idea of, of marketing it to ports and, and that was the grand idea that was where we sought where we thought the 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 main market would be and for a few years we, we sold many devices to the ports in in eastern europe they had regulations back then and they still do whereby they needed to monitor the uh, the uh, pollutions or from the accidental spills of bilge water or or um, cargo water that sh large container ships and, and cargo ships would discharge into the ports. Um, so imagine if you have a, a large port in Riga or in Singapore or, or wherever on the, the coastline, uh, you have ships coming in and out all the time, 24 seven. Um, you don't know what is happening uh, with each ship, whether they're discharging either by accident or intentionally their bellish water into the harbor which could contain oily water. And the idea is that if you could catch the perpetrators or the polluters in real time and respond within the first few minutes or hour, uh, you'd be able to catch the polluters uh, before they set sail the next morning. That was the idea. And that was one of the earlier marketing um, uh, strategies that we had. But fast forward a few years, fast forward a few years, um, we've completely diversified our portfolio of applications for the RLW. Um, now, most of our customers or most of the end users are in industry. So it's either municipal um, uh, governments who would use our technologies to monitor the incoming wastewater. The wastewater could be from residential. It could be from, from uh, industry. And... Uh, they want to monitor the wastewater for oils and for oil spills because it's an effort to protect the wastewater treatment plants. If you imagine if you're using membrane technology at the wastewater treatment plant, or if you're using sand filters, if an oil spill were to come in, it would completely wreck the system. Um, it would be at the, I mean, it could handle a certain degree, but if you have a big enough oil spill, you would overwhelm the oil and the, the wastewater treatment system. Conversely, industry. If an industry such as a steel mill or any kind of a mill or any kind of manufacturing that uses uh, water as a medium, either as a process medium or as a cooling system or cooling medium, then they would discharge the wastewater into the environment. Um, they would, of course, try to process that water as much as possible before they discharge. And if they're using, say, cutting oils or lubricant oils or any kind of cooling oils that could leak into this wastewater, then they want to be able to monitor it right at the edge of their plant before the water exits their property. And this is mainly for liability reasons, whereby if there is a, an oil spill where all the water is diverging or converging into the municipal line or municipal canal, um, an industry with our technology, with our sensor, 
could be able to safely say the oil spill did not come from us. It must have come from somewhere else. So in relation to the, to the industry, uh, we have several, many different types of industries. Um, here in Japan, we have uh, one for chemical, they, they manufacture chemicals, uh, ink. Um, they had an incident whereby uh, there was an oil spill that went into the residential or into the municipal wastewater treatment plant. Um, because the, the same water halfway came from residents and from industry, they couldn't tell uh, where the source of the oil spill came from. Uh, so that's why they installed one of our sensors right at the process water discharge so that they can be able to safely say as a liability purpose that it, the oil spill did not come from them. It, each country has their own regulations. In a country like Peru, they, they collect all their storm water and rain water that's, that's collected along the, uh, the freeway during construction and, and during the, uh, um, the rainy season, and, and they monitor the water that way. So uh, each country has their own regulations, and therefore we find different uh, niches in, in each country whereby our technology would be useful. Power plants. So one of the things that we really discovered as we continue to market our ROW sensor was that there was a significant market in the power plant industries. And uh, these power generation plants, they can, be, they can be just about any type of generation so long as they use water as a medium. So in the pictures, we have one in Poland. This is a hydro, this is a, what is, uh, it's a thermoelectric power plant. So they use water as a cooling medium and as a churning medium for their turbines. Um, conversely, in South Korea, this is a full-on hydroelectric plant uh, where they use uh, water as a, a medium. And in both cases, what they're doing is that they're using the RLW to monitor for turbine oil leaks. And uh, the idea is that if you have water coming in from an outside source, it should be clean water, of course. And then any water that's discharged should also be clean. And in that in-between process, if there is a leak, from your machines or turbines, um, they want to be able to, to monitor that in real time so that if there is a leak, they, could, they can uh, um, um, schedule the, mate, the proper maintenance uh, protocols uh, for, for, for the machinery in question. So this is an indirect way to monitor the health of a more expensive piece of equipment. And uh, what we found was that uh, with this marketing strategy and with this application, uh, they, it was much more receptive uh, to this particular industry, to our, to our sensor, uh, because it actually added value um, to, to these uh, industries. They, they wanted to be able to monitor a, a very expensive piece of equipment, um, such as a turbine, such as the machinery, in real time, and be able to, to, to do preventative maintenance uh, as they as it is required. We have some interesting applications uh, with customers that you normally don't expect with um, to, to monitor for, for oil spills and oil leaks. So in this picture, we have a beverage company. Uh, it's Coca-Cola. It's a Coca-Cola bottling plant uh, in somewhere in Spain, in Madrid. And um, if you imagined a Coca-Cola bottling plant, they, they produce their product, they use water, of course, and it's not so much about the oil in the product, but it's all about the process itself and about the size of the property. So in a bottling plant, it's a constant uh, network of traffic, the uh, trucks coming in and out for delivery of, of product, uh, whether it's the uh, trucks coming in, empty, uh, bringing in bottles, products, or shipping them out from the factory. So you can imagine the size of this, of this area. Um, the rainwater gets collected around this large plant. And why, why they want to monitor is that they want to monitor all of the wastewater, all of the rainwater, all of the processed water that gets collected and then exits their plant. So that's why we have in this picture, the, the ROW sensor, it's right at the edge of their plant. That's why they have a wireless connection and off-grid power supply. And uh, they're monitoring for any 
uh, water oil spills that may happen, whether from a truck or, or from motors or from machinery, before it exits into the environment, into the low, local wastewater treatment plants. So this is one of the unique applications that we have. It, it just shows you how diverse our, our application portfolio is. And you shouldn't be thinking, oh, it's only in oil and gas or it's only in ports. It, it, you should look at it as a holistic uh, solution to, to many different industries. So another case study. This is the, the Google Maps bird's eye view of Heathrow International Airport. And we have an installation there at a balancing reservoir. So if you imagine the size of Heathrow airports, I think there's five terminals and uh, they have tank farms for jet fuel. They have uh, uh, vehicles, uh, trucks. Um, they have the process water from the facilities themselves. So it's the size of a, a, a small town or a small city, basically. And uh, all the rainwater is collected. Um, it's being discharged into this balancing reservoir. It's basically a, a settling pond. And then this water then goes onwards into the municipal uh, wastewater treatment plants down the, downstream uh, in Heathrow. So as a, as a property manager, environmental uh, manager for the, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the entire airport, uh, they want to monitor the, uh, um, all of the, uh, the, water, the wastewater or the, the, the runoff water that's going into the environment. And of course, they, it comes down to this one point that you see on the map illustrated by the red arrow. This is the, uh, the, the installation point right there. They wanted to trial this this uh, ROW sensor for a few months to see if it works, to see if it actually um, works as advertised. And uh, so that's the that's the um, the installation there. It's using our, one of our models for light fraction. So this is specific, specifically uh, tailored to detect jet fuel. If there was a jet fuel runoff or diesel or any kind of uh, motor oils that, that may happen um, at an airport. So. In this case, they're using an off-grid power, a power pack, a battery pack with a, an online data logger. And just after about three weeks after they installed it, they actually had a, an oil spill event and it was detected. So the date, the timestamp was around the October 21st of last year at between 3 and 4 p.m. And we, we see that because of two things. First, everything was logged. So all the data was logged. Uh, what you see here is from their, uh, uh, the, the data logger that was used. This is an online uh, data logger. And basically the data that you see is uh, for one week or for one week. No, for, for two weeks. This is a two week span of data. And uh, basically what you see is that you have the background, so everything. So everything at around three thousand, between three and six thousand, the, the 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 signal is the background. So this is what you see from the 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 the, the runoff, whether it's leaves or 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 the ripples in the water or the rain or or whatnot. So this is all background that's filtered out. Um, below the alarm threshold. On the bottom axis, so the bottom axis, that's your two weeks of monitoring. So it's, it's monitoring uh, to, uh, every second for two weeks. So that's the graph. And then on the Y axis, this is your, your, your fluorescence intensity. This is uh, what, what, you, what, the, what the instrument is seeing in real time um, and, and, and how it relates to the background and, and then the oil spill. So it so happens that on that particular day, October 21st, we see a huge spike in the fluorescence intensity and it was correlated with an alarm event. So this is all logged. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a camera, there, it's, it's all uh, um, um, recorded. And it sort of so happened to be a CCTV camera uh, installed at that location, looking over into the pond. And at 
uh, it's taken, it takes a, a still shot every hour. And of course, at that time, at around four o'clock in the afternoon on October 21st, uh, there was an oil spill event. You could see the sheen in the water, and that correlates uh, directly with approx the approximate time of when the, uh, the, the alarm trigger from the ROW happened. So uh, this illustrates that indeed that the, the sensor was working, uh, that it indeed caught the oil spill, and it is up to, and it sent out the alarm, and it's up to the local authorities or environmental monitor to, manager to, to, um, uh, to deal with the, the oil spill as they see fit. Uh, just, as, just as a point of reference, this blue cable right here, that is the location of the sensor uh, relative to the spill. So with our sensor, it, it's a non-contact sensor. The enclosures allow it to be used in various environmental conditions. Um, whether it's zone one or, or, or corrosive or, or offshore. And uh, some of our distributors, some of our uh, um, uh, distributors have come up with very ingenious solutions of how to deploy our sensor. So some distributors such as in the UK or, or in Spain or in South Korea, they produce different platforms, uh, namely buoys or offshore um, uh, monitoring platforms. They could have a host of sensors on it, and then they could also have our ROW sensor. So in the case of this photo on the left, this is a installation in the United Arab Emirates. This is for a desalination plant. And the idea behind it is that if you imagine um, Dubai, it's a coastal city. It's in an area where there is high tanker traffic for oil. So oil is being shipped constantly in and, and tankers along the region. And then you have on shore a desalination uh, plant. So what it does is that it takes seawater, of course, intakes and, and desalinates it. But this process requires that the seawater not be contaminated by oil. And the idea is that with this application, they have seven or six of these buoys surrounding the plant, surrounding the intake area. Uh, each equipped with one of our ROW sensors to detect the incoming oil spills if they have if it happens into the plant. The idea is that if they could have early warning to any oil spills that may happen uh, from the sea that's coming in, they could shut down the, uh, the, the intake or deploy countermeasures uh, to, to soak up the, uh, the oil. Uh, so this is a preventative measure from basically protecting the desalination plant. Um, likewise, likewise, you have uh, installations with, on a smaller scale on, on municipalities, uh, lakes, and, and, and rivers, and ponds, uh, where they use our, our ROW uh, in this matter, where they monitor the uh, oil spills that could be happening uh, into, these, uh, into these waterways. And it just shows you that our ROW is designed to be all weatherproof. You don't need to have additional um, protection or any additional covers uh, uh, for the instrument itself. The, the instrument is uh, IP68. Even if it were to fall into the water, it's rated for around six or seven hours. Uh, so you could fish it out if it, if it does fall into the water. Um, and it's all weatherproof. So whether it's we had it tested in Norway or, or in Sweden in the wintertime, Estonia gets pretty cold, of course, minus 20 in, in the wintertime, ice, um, and snow, and we also tested it in in the Middle East under salination conditions and in, in, in the tropical heat. So whichever environment that you have it, um, the ROW is meant for that, uh, can survive those environments. So this just gives you an overview of the types of, of industries we, we focus on. I mean, originally we were, we were focused in ports, but now we completely diversify into manufacturing, into power, into wastewater. And the idea behind ports, I mean, that's still a viable industry, a viable target for our, our sensor, but now we've diversified into airports. And there's not much difference. I mean, whether it's a port or an airport, I mean, it's still the same thing. You have oil, you have um, 
potential for a leak on site, and you want that kind of 24-7 monitoring uh, um, for that purpose. Okay, I think that's, that's it. Um, I welcome your questions. If you have any anything else, please please ask. Let's have a look at the question. Okay, if you have any immediate questions, if you've got anything immediate. All right. Um, if there's no questions that come through, um, as I said at the start, our contact details are there. So um, please send them through and we will consult with Deliang to get back to you on it. Okay. Well, in the meantime, what I could do is, is, is uh, show you the demonstration that we have set up on the, the conference table here. And uh, should I stop sharing? So I think, yeah, you can stop sharing and then I will share. Your eyes are probably better than mine, John. Yeah. Um, what is it looking at? Looking at? No. Um, John, I really like this camera. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Or toggle to the camera. Is that right? Yeah, uh, but is it looking at the camera? Oh, no, is it is this is the screen looking? What's going out? Yeah, what, what's it... being broadcast? <laughs> We're broadcasting that. Or maybe you have to take, yeah, right now it's the icon. Yeah, can you say, does that say, can we pin the no, like, camera view? Sound. No, there is a pin there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is what it's broadcasting. Okay. okay, so so this is the instrument right here, the RLW sensor. I have it set up on a tripod. And as you can see, I have a business card. I don't know, yeah, well, we could, should be able to see that. So you can see the fluorescence um, zooming down on this glass. And uh, it's just a, a normal um, glassware with some water in it. And the cloth underneath is just the camera case. Um, just to serve as a background. So the sensor, I mean, it's it's quite small. It's about the size of my forearm. You have the cable coming out, and this cable provides uh, telemetry. It also provides the power. So the input power is approximately the input power is approximately the twelve to twenty four volts. So you can run this off a standard car battery. Um, if you want off-grid solutions, you could easily run this off a solar panel in a battery setup. What else? The connectors. So one example of a connector, this is, if you, this is a uh, blinking light, this is a relay. So this is connected directly to the relay and uh, it should blink. Um, if it sees oil. And um, what you could also connect it to a multimeter and whichever third party data logger uh, you have, that's also compatible. The final connection is with the Modbus. So if you have any third party data loggers via Modbus, a digital connection, you could also program that and it can, you can then change the settings in, in, in real time or log the data um, as you need it. So that is the setup. We have some canola oil here, a, a regular cooking canola oil.
So Okay, so this is the software, uh, what, what the instrument, what the ROW is looking at, and it's connected to my laptop uh, running the LVI configuration software. And so what we can do is turn this on to log, start. Okay, so. At the center of the software, we have a graph. So the graph right now, is it working? It is indeed working. So on the x-axis at the bottom of this, uh, this graph, we have uh, time or measurements. So, so it's, it's continuously monitoring, it's continuously looking at, at what capturing uh, what the RLW sensor is, is looking at. Uh, right now, the RLW sensor is Well, looking into this glass. And let me just clear the screen again. Okay. So it's looking into this glass. And at the top here, you have this uh, signal. So this is the signal coming from the glass with the water, with this uh, camera um, uh, cloth, or this cloth at the base of the table. And you're getting a signal of around 6,700. Consider that your baseline. That's your baseline signal. Um, consider that, say, your sump pit or the water. Uh, usually, it's never such a straight line. Um, if you imagine a, a sump pit, you could have flushing. You could have uh, water being pooled in. Um, you could have discharge. So it's never really a straight line. Um, it, right now, I just have the, the line zoomed out. So on the y-axis, you have the fluorescence intensity. These are arbitrary numbers. Um, uh, basically, the signal increases and decreases depending on the fluorescence. Next, we have these two dotted lines. So the first is this green dotted line at the bottom. Uh, yeah, the green dotted line at the bottom and then another red dotted line at the top. So this area, this blue area, that is your alarm zone. Uh, yeah. Whenever the signal enters into this alarm zone, it, it will generate an alarm. And of course, as the user, you can dictate how sensitive you want the instrument, whether you want it to, to, to block out certain ranges, or if you wanted to make it uh, less sensitive or more sensitive, it really depends on, on, your, on your specific application. So uh, let's pour some oil into this uh, glass, see what happens. Okay, so the response was quite immediate. Um, the screen is blocking the way, but uh, is there a way to move it? Yeah, you should be able to drag it across. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you see that uh, the, the signal increase, the amount of uh, uh, this is now, well, the first thing you see is that this, um, this is now red. So the, the, the alarm has been triggered. Um, on the table, the blinking light, I don't know if you can see that. We should be able to see that. Uh, the alarm has been triggered, so that's a, a visual indication of the alarm. The signal has increased, so right now it's looking at around 13,000 uh, signal uh, fluorescence. And right, it's stable because there's no movement. It's just a, a sheen of oil in the, uh, in the glass. And basically, you, you trigger the alarm. So it's a very simple concept. The intensity of the signal depends on the amount of oil. Uh, eventually, it, it hits a plateau. So if I add more oil,
just let it settle. Okay, so that's the, the add more oil, you get this initial burst, but then it just plateaus at, a, at, at, the, at the same amount, which suggests that for this particular vegetable oil, this canola oil, the, the maximum signal is around 13 and a half thousand. So each oil is going to react differently um, depending on, on the, the type of oil, the, the, the fluorescence uh, strength. And something like diesel, for example, you could get a signal of up to 40, 45,000, 50,000. Uh, something like gear oil or mineral oil from, uh, from turbines or, or from uh, lubricant oil, you're going to get the same thing, 50,000, 30,000. Uh, vegetable oil is on the lower end. Uh, and then crude oil could be, it depends on the type of crude oil. Um, there was light crude oil, medium, heavy crude oil. So it's going to vary from, from crude oil to crude oil. Um, so the intensity is going to be based on the type of oil and the amount of oil under the sensor. And as you can see, the, the reaction is fairly instantaneous. In this particular example, the delay, the alarm delay is one second. So you get a reaction delay of about one second. Um, but the sensor is continuously monitoring and it's taking the average out of 20 measurements in there every second. So it's basically real time uh, monitoring of the, of the sensor. This is correct, right? Cool. If I want to measure analog, should they? We have a backup multimeter that's of any use. Yeah, let's try the. Uh, Hmm. Okay. So on the multimeter, it's reading, what is it reading? Seven, seven points, 7.3. 7. So 7.3 milliamps. Um, the thing with the multimeter is that you can, you, you need to program it for scaling purposes. So right now, if you're looking at the, uh, the, 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 the advanced parameters at this small corner here, the advanced parameters say that the multimeter range is between 11,000 and 20,000. Um, you may have to scale that accordingly to make it boost higher multimeter value. So uh, one of the popular ways that industry has, has used our sensor is to connect it with their data log, their analog um, uh, data loggers. And uh, you can easily scale your PLC to multiple alarm levels. So you could say have four as your four milliamps as your baseline, you increase that to 10 milliamps uh, as a medium uh, range for so medium oil spill between 10 and 16 as your meat as your medium or four to 10 as your low and then from 16 to 20 milliamps as your high oil spill so it, it levels up accordingly depending on how you scale your milliamp um, uh, meter so yeah that's the that's the main idea of using our, our sensor it's used in real time you could use it in multiple different environments however uh, complicated or, or however uh, um, you know, harsh your environment is we have installations in the middle east all the way to the arctic um, and everything in between where the sensor is compatible with multiple uh, plcs and in third-party uh, hardware and software so you just need to decide how you want to use it and uh, basically everything you need that with the sensor itself it's the sensor and the controller together you don't have to juggle the separate uh, entities if you want just uh, this sensor to be connected to your relay or to even an oil skimmer 
that can be done as well. And you let the algorithm handle uh, all the processing and the data. So yeah, I, I welcome your questions. We have various references. We have various customers and types of customers from around the world. So there's most likely uh, an application that we've delved in before and, and, and we welcome your questions. And we also welcome new applications. If there is an industry that, that would be interested in, in our oil sensor uh, for their particular industry, uh, we also love to talk about it, maybe explore the possibilities. Um, I was in a trade show exhibition in Canada, and basically every second question was about using our sensor in uh, monitoring uh, boreholes or well water um, to, to look at uh, oil spills and that. And in that case, it really depends on how you, you, you use it. Because yes, you can move this. The, the beauty about non-contact sensor is that you can move the sensor. You can move it from one borehole to the other. But if you're monitoring it just for one hour or a couple of hours, the ROW sensor relies on making changes. It relies on the change in environment or change in the in in what the the, the water that it's monitoring to happen in order to see anything. So right now, I mean. I've been talking for the last um, couple, uh, three minutes, and the sensor is looking into this glass with, with oil. And basically, after a few minutes, uh, after three minutes, you get a, a flat line. So if you're monitoring a borehole for one hour or two hours, and you expect to get a result, unless something changes, you're basically going to get a flat line. But that doesn't mean it, it's not working. It, it does work. It's just that if there's no change, then you're not going to see any change. Okay. I think I've covered everything. All right. Fantastic. Questions from this audience or from the online audience? I, I welcome the questions. What's the What's the longest you've had um, one of these deployed at a site? So you can run so long it has power six or seven years yeah um the l the only consumable or the only part that needs to be refurbished would be the led so the led um which is the source of the uv light it has about five years um according to that manufacturer's uh, um, description and then we have to swap out the led for another five years now that doesn't mean that at five years the LED is going to stop working. It's just that it will degrade around that time. Yeah. So you have to swap it out and then you get another five years of service from it. Do you find you ever have to clean the, the lens on them and, um, when it's out in the environment? So depending on the environment, um, the only part that, that, that would be exposed that you really need to clean would be the lens. And that would be as easy as using a, a cloth or clean cloth and, and, and wiping the lens every so often if you need it. So let me go back to the, uh, the regular camera. So the, the, this, the, the sensor that you see, the parts that you see now, this is the, the sensor and the controller. Now, if you go to our website, or if you look at any of our brochures, you'll notice that this orange uh, system, it has a extended part. And that extended tube, it's, it's basically a metal tube. It's, a, it's an aluminum tube. It's just an extension that we put there and we call it the sun shield. And that serves two purposes. It serves to A, block out ambient light. So if there's direct sunlight, you don't want it to hit the, 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 the sensor. Uh, so it blocks that out and it also protects the lens so the lens is is underneath it's uh well you can see the uh, the, the led and the lens is just right here and it's, it is a camera lens so that if you have say spider webs or bugs or any other debris that's 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 um blocking the lens then that negates the effect of the instrument it blocks the instrument but you want to be able to clean it every so often or at least check on it, that it's indeed um, not obstructed. That's about the only 
only um, uh, maintenance that you have to do, or it's not even maintenance. It's mostly checking that the sensor is still operating. You can do that remotely. You can connect, you can look at the data, and if there's a drop in the signal, that means there's something blocking the sensor, and then you want to be able to, uh, to clear that up. But if everything is moving correctly, it's still logging the data, then nothing is wrong, and you can continue to use it. Um, we've had installations, for example, we had one installation in the in Estonia. This was a test trial. Uh, this was placed on one of our buoys. And uh, in the wintertime, you have sea spray, you have waves coming in. And uh, there was one time where the entire bottom part was just blocked with ice. I don't know if you get ice storms in, in Australia, but uh, that blocked the sensor. I mean, it's still working. The, the sensor is still working. It's just that because you blocked it, uh, you're getting a, a reading of zero. So with the, with the installation, I mean, everything that you need to control is from this cable. The most difficult part with operating this ROW sensor is actually at the beginning, the setup part where you have to position it in a way where that the sensor is looking into the water. It's as line of sight to the water um, and that it is properly connected, powered and, and mounted. After that is done, everything else is, can be controlled by either Modbus or using our software um, to make adjustments. So the, the sensor itself has a, a TCP connection that could be using our software or Modbus. And that means that if you connect it and install it in a remote area, like if, you, if this was offshore somewhere, you can be in your office in Melbourne programming and adjusting the sensor as needed. So long as all the connections in between are properly done and, and protected, uh, you can make setting changes and parameter changes from your office and saving it uh, to the sensor and it will continue to work uh, remotely. You just have to log the data. Yeah. Oh, that's a um, oh, yeah. Does that conclude everything? That concludes everything. Right. But I, I welcome your questions if and when we get them. Fantastic. Thanks everyone for um, joining us. That's been really informative. Thank you, Dirley Annie. Thanks to Laser Thank Diagnostic you. Instruments. Um, and Please send through any questions. Um, we'd be glad to answer.